Should we go? Yeah, all right. So let me um, just kick things off here. Um, hopefully uh, all the attendees are hearing this. Uh, we have a bunch of panelists for our first event of CCM 2021, <laughs> all virtual, uh, which is new for us, but hopefully this runs smoothly. Um, there's a bunch of settings that we have in place. Um, I think everything is as we planned, but please let us know if something seems off. Um, if you have any technical issues uh, connecting, or if you know anyone with issues, uh, as we say on the program on the CCN website, please email info at ccneuro.org. Um, just a bit of logistics here. Uh, um, for the CCN events, which we have uh, nine of them in total, um, uh, as, is, as is usual, we'll, uh, we have chat enabled in case any in the audience wants to chat um, for formal questions and Q&A. Uh, there's also a Zoom feature called Q&A, which you're probably familiar with. Um, that's also enabled. Uh, feel free to type questions at any time. Uh, we will, generally speaking, field questions and ask the speaker questions at the end of their presentation. Um, audience members can also upvote and comment on uh, questions that people ask. So please feel free to do that. Uh, at any time. And um, we can also, if, if, if uh, you agree, we can ask you, allow you to ask a question in person if you'd like. Uh, otherwise, we can also um, just read the question out loud. Um, other logistics. Um, so this event will be roughly three hours. So it's a bit of a long haul, but uh, luckily it's the only event today. <laughs> and um, yeah, so um, yes, feel free to type a chat message. I think you can direct uh, your uh, chat or questions or concerns to the hosts and panelists if you want to ask like an administrative question. So please feel free to do that. We will monitor um, the chat as we uh, proceed. And I believe someone has already raised their hand. So um, we can test out this feature. I will allow you to talk. Talking has been permitted for Dennis. Okay, maybe that was just a test or maybe they're having trouble with their audio input. Um, so let me uh, close that out. Okay, anyway, so yes, to start things off, uh, we have here Thomas Nazalaris, uh, one of the CCN organizers to give us a little bit of overview of how we've envisioned the events this year. Take it away, Thomas. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, and welcome everyone to CCN 2021. It's our fifth oh, year. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. This is being recorded. Uh, if oh. When you joined, I assume you heard the little audio voice saying it is recorded. All of our events we're planning to uh, make publicly available as has been our usual habit. Um, so, you know, in case you need to take a break or you need to step out, don't worry, it's all recorded. Cool. All right, thanks. Yeah, w welcome everyone. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Thomas Nostolaris. I'm the chair of the executive committee, and we're super excited to get the virtual program started. As I said, it's our fifth year, our second as a virtual conference, and we are, we are eyeing San Francisco uh, as a physical location for our conference next year, um, but we are obviously keeping an eye on events as they unfold, so more information on that coming. The we have a number of uh, three types of, of offerings this year, and they're they're different, a little bit different from what we've offered in the past. And, and the, the format is maybe different from what you are used to uh, attending other virtual conferences as well. So I'm going to take the opening remarks this year just to briefly talk about our new event types. I want to start by <clears throat> acknowledging uh, my co-organizers. And uh, in particular, I would like to thank and acknowledge the program committee. It's, uh, you know, during a, a year of a virtual conference, the program committee does, does most of the work. They're really the heart and soul of the conference. And they worked really hard and brought, I think, a lot of enthusiasm and creativity to and, and, and innovation, I think. And I, I would like to give a particular shout out to Gunnar and Megan, the co-chairs, for their leadership, they've done a fantastic job. Okay, so as I said, there's there's three event types. The first is Algonauts. You're going to hear all about it in just a few minutes from the organizers. It's a prediction competition, and it's going to be awesome. The other two event types that we've developed this year are generative adversarial collaborations, or GACs, and then uh, a coupled keynote and tutorial. 
So I'm going to talk just very briefly about uh, both of those and uh, our, our thinking behind developing these two. So we'll start off with the GEC, which is the, 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 the image shows is meant to be a sort of friendly or let's say productive collaborative uh, rivalry between researchers who have uh, opposing views or at least different views on similar topics, right? So this is how we envision GACs working and, and, and hope they work. So researchers that have alternate theories are gonna form a GAC, self-assemble um, into, a, into a team that proposes uh, a GAC event. And the idea is they are gonna try to work towards an agreement, uh, at least ideally, about how best, uh, the best possible, most fair way to, to disambiguate theory. So the ideal outcome for GAC would be a test that all of the participants agree on, um, whose answer would, uh, who, whose result rather, would give an answer to a persistent and, and a hard problem. And the, why are we doing this? It's an attempt to kind of change the dynamic to, uh, you know, try to uh, actually use the, the virtual format that we've all been sort of forced into as a way of changing the dynamic around collaboration and making competition more collaborative, if that makes sense. Um, the, uh, the benefits to the CCN community, there are a number that, that we're hoping to deliver. The first is that it's a great learning opportunity for early career researchers, uh, a number of whom are participating in the GACs. It's a chance uh, to increase community engagement. So these GAC sessions are gonna be a mixture of lectures and debate and, and uh, uh, debate amongst the presenters as well as the audience. And uh, as we were thinking that the more the merrier, the more diversity, the better. Um, and it's also a way of kind of introducing, we hope, uh, or inflecting at least the, some, some, Democrat, <clears throat> some democratic um, flavor to the way that, that the projects are developed, to the way the scientific problems are projects are developed and, and questions are answered. And there's also a lot of transparency built into the GAC. So the, the sessions that you're going to see today, are, uh, sorry, over the course of the next month are um, what we call GAC kickoff events. So it's the initial public discussion of the problem, um, which you are all encouraged to obviously attend and, and engage in during the session. But after the GAC, the, the fun continues. So after the GAC kickoff, the fun continues. So this is the second year of offering the, these adversarial collaborations. In 2020, we had a number of these sessions as well. So, and this is gonna be true for all GAC sessions going forward. The, the materials are public, so the, it's recorded. You can access that through the website. And one of the things that the program committee is, has uh, worked to develop, which I think is very exciting, is a GAC special issue in the Neurons Behavior Data Analysis and Theory Journal. So there are already GAC papers based on 2020, there are already papers based on 2020 GACs that are um, in preprint form um, that you can read. And the, um, there is an opportunity for you to continue to participate in the conversation by submitting a GAC commentary from one of the papers. And what we want to do, again, is have a sort of public record of how uh, a problem was developed and hopefully potentially solved. So these are the GACs for this year. There's four, including a progress report from the 2020 GACs. And as you'll see, the, the way that we're organizing the conference this year is we're gonna have um, events spread out through the month of September. And I think going up to October 1st is our last presentation. And they're going to be several hours long each, but it'll be the only CCN offering for that day. So there's no overlap. Um, and that brings me to the keynote and tutorials. So this is the, the second event type that we're offering. So you're all familiar with a keynote lecture. The idea behind coupling that with the tutorial is to kind of pop the hood on the science that goes and the results that go into uh, uh, the kind of standard keynote lecture. So presenters will deliver a lecture full of results and a lot of new and probably uh, <clears throat> uh, innovative method, methods. And then that's gonna be followed by a tutorial workshop with uh, most of which will have interactive code exercises so that people can um, 
so that attendees can work along and immediately begin to exercise some of the concepts and code and methods that go into the work. Um, this is new. Um, I, I think this way of doing it is, is uh, a good way to uh, showcase the team that puts uh, a lot of the work that goes into the, uh, a keynote, a, your typical keynote lecture. Um, benefits to the community again. Um, well, it allows you to learn again about the science and the tools behind them. Um, through the tutorials, there's a chance for uh, community engagement. And again, there is a lot of transparency built in because you're, you're kind of being able to pull back the curtain and see how, tech, or how results um, were achieved, at least uh, at the level of, of the analysis code. These are the awesome uh, keynote and tutorials that we have lined up for, for the month. Again, they're all on separate days and will last uh, several hours. So I hope this is a good uh, success. It's obviously an experiment. Um, you know, all of the, I think all the virtual conferences are, um, but uh, participate, join in and have as much fun as you can. Um, and with that, we will turn it over to the Algonauts team um, to hear uh, about the results of their project. Thanks. All right, yeah, let me just step in with a little bit of logistics for those uh, who are just joining. Uh, we just got done with a little intro from Thomas. Uh, just to remind you, uh, this whole event, and actually all the events will be recorded so you can review them at your leisure. And during the event today, feel free to use all the various Zoom features, use chat for little chat things. Formal questions can be done through Q&A. Um, and you can also, I guess, raise your hand as an attendee if there's a burning question you want to an um, have answered. But we will, um, generally speaking, gather the Q&A uh, after each presenter is done, and we will uh, deal with questions um, at that time. All right, so let's move on to the actual event. So Algonauts, um, we have Radic Sishi, uh, who will give, I suppose, an intro um, to uh, Algonauts. Great. Um, thanks so much, Thomas and Kendrick, for the introduction. I hope you can all see the slides and hear me. Can you? Just Looks good. OK, cool. Thanks. OK, so let me close the chat. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this digital event. I'm happy and honored uh, to kickstart this year's cognitive uh, computational neuroscience meeting. Uh, first of all, of course, thanks a lot to the organizers for putting this event up in these rather difficult circumstances and for being so kind to let us give us the opportunity to team up. So in the next 2.5 or so hours, we would like to present to you the outcome of the Argonauts challenge of this year, 2021, how the human brain makes sense of a world in motion. And now, who is we? Um, the Algonauts project and challenge is a significant effort. Um, so there is a large international team at several sites working together to make this happen. And under the guidance of Ode Oliver at MIT, uh, Gemma Roj at uh, Goethe University Frankfurt, and my humble self in Berlin. And I only stand here in representative function for this great team that did this work. I would like to thank everyone on the team for this continuous work over the last year, and also all funders that contributed to this. Okay, great. So now you might ask, so what is this whole thing about, or session? Um, we have two main parts framed by two shorter contributions. The framing is by me. I will begin with an introduction of the challenge of about 10-15 you know, minutes. I will tell you about the goals, the spirit of this whole endeavor, why are we doing this, and what is in summary the outcome. Uh, and I will also close the whole session with a very short announcement of what uh, the Argonauts challenge is going to be in the year 22. And I think we have a very clear and exciting plan for you. In between is the important stuff. So first, uh, Kshitish Vivedi will lead a hands-on session on the development kit of the Argonauts um, challenge, basically telling you how you could participate, how all of this works. So this is consistent with the spirit of this year's CCN to make this a more practical rather than um, um, theoretical thing. And second, we will hear talks um, of 12 minutes each from the top teams that won the challenge. Um, I will not preempt you, of course, how they solved it, but I can only say that much that these participants used very diverse approaches and they have therefore very interestingly probed the space of how you can go about explaining 
what um, how the brain makes sense of a world in motion. Okay, so let me start with the framing. Um, let me give you the reason why we put up uh, the AP in the first place. So recent times has seen the strength and interaction between artificial and natural intelligence research. Brain-inspired human-engineered AI, deep nets, for example, are not the standard for predicting human brain responses in some fields of cognitive neuroscience. And in turn, the brain continues to inspire invention and innovation in AI, as you see in many companies in computer science that are very close to biology. Now, with this being done, how is the interaction to be done best? So um, how can we make the interaction between these fields look most efficient? How can we drive things faster? How can we take the best from the past of doing science without repeating the mistakes and the things that we don't like about science? And how can we contribute to create an environment where both uh, sciences of artificial and natural intelligence can excel? Now, we want to provide a scientific tool we believe can be transformative of how AI and natural intelligence research is done and also for the better. This way is, as you might have guessed naturally, open challenges as a quantitative communication channel. Now, here we take inspiration from other fields such as computer vision, robotics, natural language understanding, and others where challenges with standardized benchmarks have played a very fruitful role in the development of the field. And they're also uh, widely accepted by the community as a valuable scientific tool. Therefore, we propose open challenges at the intersection of AI and NI with the goal to explain human brain activity for different cognitive functions, which might be some type of vision, which might be any other function that you might think of, such as object vision by AI models. Now, you might be thinking, okay, sure, why not a challenge? Uh, makes some sense, uh, but why me? Why should I care about this? What's in there for me? Uh, why should be involved? Now, I would like to argue what you can get out of this in just bullet points, bam, bam, bam. And I think that considered as scientific instruments, open challenges have a unique advantages set of properties for topics at the intersection of artificial and natural intelligence. So let me go through this. Maybe one of them speaks to you. First, they very naturally do what they want. What we want, they foster communication and collaboration by their very nature. So they provide a platform to talk, to interact, and a common goal for research fields that have very disparate, different targets, methods, customs, histories, um, and, and incentive structures. Second, they are rather efficient and fast paced. You have a short turnaround cycle, you have deadlines, and thus they drive progress. It's not that things are open-ended, they must be done at a particular point. Third, um, quantitative benchmarks, give you two facts. For one, they give you a precise metric of success. In the end, it boils down to a number. You might maybe not like the very particular definition of that number, but it is a very clear and honest number to which you can relate. And second, it enables model comparison directly, which can give you important theoretical insights. By looking at which models perform better and which models perform worse, you can then make inference about what it is about those that make them better or worse models. Next, testing a model can be considered as testing a hypothesis with the model embodies. So therefore, this effort contributes not only to prediction, which is one of the science's goals, but also indirectly to explanation, which is the other big goal of science. So it does not stop short the prediction, it goes all the way. Next, they have transparency and openness, qualities that we increasingly learn to cherish in the communities naturally built in. Everyone can participate, results are public, and there is no need to tinker with the existing science and publishing system. You have the desirables right built in. They are coming there for free. Also a more science political point, they are at the right grain, I would argue, the intermediate level of complexity for collaboration. So when you solve a particular problem, uh, the best solution, of course, must be appropriate in many ways to solving that. And when we think about how many people have to work together to solve a particular problem in cognitive computation and neuroscience, I would say that most of them right now at this point of history are too large for single laboratories. Uh, 
but they are also too small to have a huge unified institute which follows one goal. And therefore challenges are at this intermediate scale where many people come together in a particular way. And I think that this level is at which the solution can be found best. For example, GEX can, could, uh, I would argue, be found at the same meso scale. So I hope some of those reasons convinced you that there is something in there for you. Now, the question in this year's challenge is the following. The world does not ever stand still, it moves. This movement tells us what is going on. So we chunk the world in events that have a particular duration where stuff happens. And we don't think of the world in terms of static uh, states that follow one after the other. So for example, when we look at those videos, we see such events as a panda eating or a child is crying, a man is paddling in a boat, balloons are flying in the air, and so forth and so on. Now, so to understand the world, we, whether we are artificial or natural agents, need to understand how to do that, how to get the meaning out of this world in motion. So how does the brain do it? How does the artificial agent do it? We make this question the center of our challenge. What we do is the following. We provide data of natural agents, humans, that watch videos of events and the brain responses while they perceive them. Second, we ask participants to provide your model of understanding events, whatever it is, suit yourself. It can be your particular deep net, it can be anything else that you think of. And third, then based on the model, you can create synthetic brain responses, basically make your, relate your model to the brain so that in the fourth step, um, we are at the challenge and then we compare your predictions to the real recorded brain responses. And the better the fit, the better your score, which then populates a leaderboard. Okay, let us look at some of these steps in a little bit more detail. The data that we provided comes in two flavors. First, we provide training data. This is 1,000 three-second videos and the human brain responses in 10 human participants recorded with fMRI. Uh, fMRI provides us a high space resolution of human brain function, if you wish. Now, so if you want, you can now use this data to create models or to create a mapping between models and brain responses. The second flavor of data that we provide is testing data. We have 102 separate videos, which we also provide, but we withhold the brain responses. So it is on the output of the models to these videos that we will fit your, uh, that we will check the fit of your uh, predictions to the real human brain. So how do we evaluate submissions in detail? We have for each voxel of interest, uh, where a voxel is a small volume of brain tissue, an empirical measurement of what happened in the brain when humans saw uh, each of those 102 test videos, as you can see here on the left. Um, we get a submissions that predicted responses from the model, which you give us. We then just compare them simply by taking the correlation we average this across all voxels that we care about and then get one average number, which then becomes a number in the leaderboard. Now we express the correlation, how similar the predicted to the real um, recorded brain activity is uh, with respect to a noise ceiling. That is an estimate of the maximal correlation that a hypothetical perfect model could get given the noisiness of our data. So a perfect model could get a one here. The challenge ran on two tracks. There was a full track where all voxels in the brain were evaluated that gave a reliable response. You can see that shown here on the top of the slide in warm colors. And also a second smaller, a mini track where we have less voxels um, defined in nine key regions of the visual brain, which include early visual uh, level areas like V1 to V4, early and mid-level, then category selective regions, which respond more to particular categories such as bodies, faces, objects and places. So both used a very similar setup, but the mini track was computationally a bit more uh, tractable or easier. Now, while conceptually straightforward, the exact of this setup of this challenge is of course always peculiar in particular. So to get you started, we provided a dev kit. Uh, this was in the beginning a GitHub repository to guide through an example uh, the whole way from a computational model to how you would make a submission. 
And then we had an update as a Google Colab to prepare the challenge submission online for you step by step. And on the basis of this, um, Kshiti will lead you through this um, hands on tutorial. Now, there is no game without rules. We need some rules to the challenge, but to encourage participation and to not make things too complicated, uh, we kept the rules as minimal as we can. And each rule was uh, justified by the rationality and the spirit of the challenge. So we said participants can use therefore any model from any source trained on any type of data that they want. So this gives you the type of freedom and flexibility to try whatever you wish. Now, there was one exception we excluded the use of brain data to test videos. So you could have just taken the videos that we provide as a test and recorded brain activity in some human beings and submitted that. Now, this is not an uninteresting thing to do, but we would not have learned what we want to learn because there is a step of building an artifact that's not biological that does the job rather than taking a ready-made human brain that is essential for building progress. And last, we request participants to, to submit short reports uh, to a preprint server or to us to be considered. So it's, this is, I think, necessary to ensure that there's openness and transparency of science. Now, who participated? We had about uh, above 300 downloads, um, different number of people signed up, and of those uh, subsets submitted. Uh, as expected, there were more participants for the mini challenge because it's less computationally extensive, expensive. And also we had a bit less participation in 2019, also as expected, because the challenge now was more involved. We had many more degrees of freedom, more data, which means more fun, but also more work. Now the challenge itself is closed, but the submission, meaning the model evaluation, of course, is still possible. So if you care, you can check your model against our data until we close it and release the data, which will be likely sometime in 2022. Now let's look at the results of the mini track first. You see here a snapshot of the leaderboard with rank, team name, uh, then the different regions for which I've shown two, V1 to PPA, where we showed a noise normalized correlation, which can go up to one, and then the average score. Uh, we see the different participants uh, of, of from whom you will see their solutions presented in the third part of this, um, of this challenge, at this point, I only want to say that if we compare the best submission to our baseline, which was just a vanilla AlexNet, we see a 1.6 fold increase in correlation. So therefore, a, let's say a, a success in better predicting human brain activity. How did the full track look like? Um, to visualize this in a representative example, you see a hemisphere and an example subject for the baseline on the left, and for the winner on the right. So the colors give you the correlation values of how well you can explain activity in particular parts of the brain. And we see a much better prediction throughout the visual brain in the occipital lobe and also in more parietal regions. So I think it's fair to say that, we, that this submission strongly improved the predictions throughout. Now, the leaderboard of the full track is a bit simpler. There is a similar ranking as in the mini challenge, but there's only one number because we aggregate all predictions across all voxels, which gives us a leaderboard. And to summarize this, in sum, we see about a 1.8 fold increase in correlation over the baseline that we provided. So again, I think um, a success. So in that, the goal was to explain how the human brain makes sense of a world in motion. We have made some progress towards this goal. This would close my intro. And without much further ado, I would like to hand over to Kshidi Stvivedi, who is going to guide you through the nuts and bolts of this year's challenge development kit in a practical session. Great. Uh, before we move on, let's leave at least 30 seconds for people to potentially ask questions since sure. you showed some exciting results at the very last couple slides. So let's just pause for about half a minute. Sure. Again, feel free to type questions in the Q&A, or if you'd rather speak your question, just raise your hand. I'll ask you a question, Radic. So your method for improving model prediction was to create algonauts, and there you go. Now you have <laughs> almost twofold increase in correlations. 
that's not quite a question more of a remark no yes yeah. you can say i just making my life very easy right <laughs> but i think this is exactly what is required so at some point i asked okay do i want to do it do i have the skills can i do it fastest and i thought no if we make this a community effort it's going to go much better Okay, I don't see any questions, but you know, in case you one comes up later, feel free to type it, uh, and we'll move on to Kashiti. Hopefully, I did not mangle that pronunciation. Uh, sorry, Kashiti, we we cannot hear you for some reason. Not yet. Uh, let's check your audio settings. One moment. Can uh, is it audible now? That's good. Um, it it's a little bit of background noise. Um, I don't know if you can reposition your microphone. Oh, probably not. But if it's fine, I'll just start now. Right now, it's good. You actually improved it. Whatever you did. Okay. So. So uh, can you see my screen? No. Yep. Okay. So hello everyone. I will present the hands-on tutorial on Algonos challenge. And my name is Shatish, and I'm a PhD student at uh, Goethe University. So, so how this session will work is like in two parts, and we'll keep switching between methods and code. So I'll present the methods to Google Slides, and then we'll go over the codes, uh, some code to run the methods and feel free to ask questions in between using Q&A. So before, uh, before starting, let's download the data first because it takes uh, time for around five minutes. The link to collab is this one. So you can also try it. I'll also copy it in chat and uh, here. Okay. Just now I typed it. Um, oh. oh, there we go. Okay, thanks. So, so once you go click on uh, go to this link, then oh, okay. Then here is uh, those who are, of you who are not familiar with Colab. It's an online Jupyter notebook and uh, where you can run the code online. And here you can explore the table of contents so that to guide and navigate you through the code. And then so here, here are some terms of use to how to use the data. And then uh, these are the play buttons. If you play it, then it just runs the code, whatever is inside it. And it's for readability, I have hidden some of some of the code which are not necessary for the tutorial. But if you are interested, you can just click on show code and it just shows it. And here's the link to download the data. It takes around five minutes. Okay. Then let's go back to the slides. So here you have to click on the play buttons to run the installation, imports, and download the data. Now, the outline of this task, uh, uh, talk is as follows. So first we'll discuss how the data is organized and to load and visualize the data and how do we select which voxel were relevant for our challenge. And then we'll go over some baselines, one image model, uh, which is resident 18, and a corresponding video model Resident 18 with the additional temporal dimension to extract the features from the videos and use them to predict the brain responses and then evaluate using validation split and then prepare the submission file that you can submit to our, our challenge server. So first let's look at the loading and visualizing the data. So the data directory consists of two, right, uh, two folders. First is uh, the videos which have like we all the video files for training and test. Then 
the data directory of uh, participants contains fMRI data files. So it only uh, contains fMRI data for the training. And there are two subfolders, one for full track that contains the whole brand responses, and one for mini track that contains the mini track responses. Now inside the video directories, these are the list of files for for all the videos and for video files from 001 to 1000 are training videos and 1001 to 1102 are test videos and here is an example so each video file is a three second long video which you can put right here uh, and then uh, for the full track directory the data is organized as follows so each subject has a, uh, its own directory and then the, uh, inside the subject directory, there's a file called wb.pkl that corresponds to whole brain. And it, this file is a Python dictionary, uh, which contains train. Uh, so the train is, contains the main data, or, or it's a 3D or three dimensional array, uh, which has dimension corresponding to number of videos, number of repetitions, and uh, so how many times the video was presented to participants and the number of voxels. And it also contains a voxel mask to map the results back to, uh, 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 back to brain for visualization purposes. In the mini track folder, uh, the data organizes similarity. So inside each sub, uh, there are sub directories for subjects and inside each sub uh, directory, uh, subject directory, there are eight files corresponding to eight ROIs. And each file is a Python dictionary that contains the uh, fMRI data. And uh, these ROIs are from early visual cortex on uh, face and body selective areas and the you know, object and scene selective areas. Now we'll go back to Collab now. So hopefully, uh, people might have downloaded the data yet. So, it, so if not, you can follow. So here you have to run uh, the utility functions for data loading. So these are some function or wrapper function, and here you could visualize all the videos on the data set. So you can write a number, like let's say we want uh, we want to look at video number hundred, and um, so this is the 100th video. Uh, we could uh, visualize the corresponding brain response from a given subject. So we run this file. And here we could uh, look at different subjects' responses for, for this video. Now, if you want to load the whole, uh, like the whole data set for, for a given ROI, we have to give the ROI file path so you can navigate through here. So these are the, the files. And uh, now here inside the participants data, mini track, if I want to look at, let's say subject four, uh, EBA, I could just copy the path and replace it here. And then this will load the pickle file. So it has uh, uh, one key because but it doesn't have voxel mask. So because uh, voxel mask is only available for all the whole brain. And uh, if we want to look at the whole brain uh, data set, uh, we could just replace this by full track and we'll give the correct path. So these are the dimensions of the data. So like 1003. Uh, so 1,000 for uh, 1,000 training videos, three for the number of times the uh, video was presented to the participants, and 19,000 voxels. And the voxel mask is uh, a fMRI cube in MNI space. It has one where the voxels were reliable and zero where which voxels were not taken into account for our challenge. Now let's switch back to uh, uh, these slides. So having looked at the data, I was talking about which voxels did we take into account for the challenge and we call them uh, it's reliably based on reliability. So the basic idea behind it is that, so if let's say a video is presented to a participant and we uh, in two trials, uh, we have the voxel V's activity for, for trial one and trial two, we measure the distance between the uh, this voxel's activity 
and then for uh, and then there are other videos that were presented to the participants and uh, corresponding activity for the same voxel. So the idea behind uh, 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 assumption behind the reliability is that the voxel response uh, to the same videos should be closer to uh, each other as compared to uh, a different video. So if the distance between the uh, fMRI response of the same video is uh, closer than the fMRI response to other videos, then that uh, voxel is reliable. To put in, in more uh, detail, uh, so how we did it in the test set video, using the test set videos. So we had around 102 test videos and for each video was presented 10 times. So we had 10 trials. And let's say we have the voxel V's activity. Uh, we recall the voxel V activity 10, uh, in 10 different trials. So what we did to calculate the reliability was, so we divided the 10 trials into two splits. So uh, voxel V's activity averaged over a split one for trials one to five. And for example, uh, in the last five trials, the four is split two, and then get these two vectors and use the Pearson's R to quantify this, uh, the uh, similarity between the splits. Now it's possible to have multiple splits of these, uh, uh, of these two. So we repeat it from the same procedure for all possible splits. And we average R across the splits. And then we set a criteria that if R is greater than threshold, then that voxel is reliable. So we can go back to the collab to run the uh, reliability for the training data. So here we again, oh, we can select a subject. Uh, let's say subject four, and uh, well, since uh, we are visualizing, so I have, uh, we can set ROI only to whole brain because the visualization is only possible for whole brain. And these are some setting up paths. So what I do is first get fMRI data for all trials, then calculate the split half reliability as we go, uh, as explained previously, and then visualize it. So if I run it. You can see that the uh, uh, most reliable voxels are uh, using the training data are uh, in the visual cortex. And there are also some other voxels with uh, slightly negative reliability. And this could happen because uh, uh, these voxels, uh, the, we are calculating the reliability over the training set, which only had three tiles. So there's more noise here than uh, as compared to test data. If you're interested, you could click on the show code here to uh, uh, to find like exactly how the split half reliability is calculated. So um, we first uh, find all the subsets here uh, we'll to get the splits and then we measure the correlation between two splits for all the possible uh, combinations and then return it. So this is the, uh, now how we have calculated the reliability, we can move on to the next step. So now comes the interesting part, like uh, how, how do we predict uh, the fMRI responses from the, uh, uh, from the brain, uh, uh, from the models. So as this step takes time, so uh, I, around 10 minutes. So what I would suggest you, if you are, running in parallel is to run these two, three, uh, these three cells to, so that the feature extraction, so what it does is these are the wrapper function for extracting or loading the videos and extracting the features. And here we are defining two models. So ResNet 18 and ResNet 3D. And, and there's a, you know, a nice library to extract the features from the PyTorch model. This is called the uh, Torch Extractor, which we are using here. And then uh, the uh, the feature extraction co code. You, this is does the most uh, all the jobs. So it will run if we run it. It will extract the features for these two models. And as you can see, it takes around four minutes for each model. So uh, we'll have to wait for eight minutes. And I'll now go back and. 
uh, explain me how, how it's done. So first I'll summarize like how uh, we are go, uh, the works and device encoding works, and then I will explain each step in detail. So let's say we have a, a training set of stimulus videos. We apply a computational model to extract the model activations. And since we have the voxel V's activity in the training set, we use it to learn a linear mapping from model activations to, uh, to uh, voxel V's activity. Now, given the test videos, what we do is we apply the same computation model to extract the model activations and then apply the learned linear mapping to predict the voxel V's activity on the test set. Now, this activity is you know, see, uh, uh, is what is submitted to the challenge for evaluation. Now, as a baseline, we are taking here ResNet 18 and ResNet 18 3D. So ResNet 18 is an 18 layer model with the skip connections. And it was trained on image classification task on ImageNet. The 3D version of ResNet 18 is has uh, is the same uh, has the same architecture, but with additional dimension for temporal information, and a strain on action recognition task on kinetics data set. So we'll look at the average pool layer here, because here, you know, for two reasons. First, the dimension is low enough to uh, run the code, so it's a uh, 512 dimensional, and it's the it's the same across two models. So in one case, the, uh, the pooling is done across the spatial dimension, and in other case, the pooling is done across the spatial and temporal dimensions. So uh, how do we extract features from ResNet 18? What we do is we take a frame, we feed forward it to ResNet 18 pre-trained model, we get a feature map, we do it for the other, other frames, and we uh, average the feature maps across frames. Then we perform dimensionality reduction to compress it to 100 dimensional feature vector. For ResNet 18 3D, it's more simple because it uh, takes the sequence of frames as the input and you input the sequence of frames into the model and uh, you get a feature map and you directly apply PCA here. And once we have uh, the, the, we know, now we know how to extract the feature vectors, what we could do is we can learn a linear mapping from uh, feature maps to brain data. So here it goes. Uh, uh, so we have the training videos, we have the model features in terms of uh, PCA compressed vectors, and we have the voxel V's activity for the training data. We estimate the uh, uh, feature to voxel V's mapping called phi. And in this case, we are considering a linear mapping. And for test videos, we again extract the model features. We apply phi and we submit this predicted voxel uh, V's activity to the challenge to get the evaluation score. So in this, so evaluation is done as follows. So we have the test, valor, test or validation set videos. So these are uh, and corresponding voxels activity for these videos and the predicted voxel activity, uh, activity from the model. And then we comp uh, compare these two vectors using Pearson correlation and then average across all the reliable voxels. So we'll go back to Colab and hopefully we have extracted the features. So it's taking time. So if you have any questions, I think it's a good time to ask now.
Okay, we have a few questions. Um, one from Anonymous uh, was asking about the choice of 100 PCs. Was that choice arbitrary here? So what we did was we um, selected like uh, 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 like a cross validation of 10 principal components, 50, 100, and so on, and 1,000. Because 1,000 is the maximum principal component we can take here as the number of videos as 1,000. And then we found at around 100 was a good number for accuracy, so we chose, we chose uh, the 100 for that reason. And this is the same. This was the same across multiple models. So you know that's why. We, Okay, yeah. All right, uh, we have another question. Um, Pranad Sharma asks, why have you chosen uh, ResNet 18? Okay, so for this tutorial, I've chosen ResNet 18 because there was a corresponding 3D model available. So we could compare like whether the temporal information uh, plays any role in pr prediction or not. And um, there's no uh, other reason for choosing the ResNet 18. So it's a, it's a good baseline and it was a corresponding 3D model. Okay, uh, those are all the questions at this point. Okay. Then uh, also the collab is self-explanatory because it's a uh, real there are thing I, I'll explain most of the things here. And then once uh, I think it will take around one to two minutes before we see the re results. Okay, then once you have, uh, if you already have extracted the features, you can run the, uh, the next code. So these are the functional utility function for reg regression. And, and then uh, this is a wrapper function for encoding. If you're interested, you could just click show code and uh, there are comments to explain what's happening here. And then what we do is we take like a list of all, so we evaluate over all subjects. So what I've done is split the data into uh, two parts. Like we have to selecting first 900 videos as the training and uh, the last 100 as the validation. Since we don't have access to the test, test fMRI data, and we are do, evaluating this in uh, the validation mode. So we, this is the list of the subject. This is the fMRI directory. And uh, here is the, where the predictions will be saved. And we are doing it for the mini track. So we are, these are the list of ROIs we are interested in. And here, we, let me just change the layer to average pool. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go over all the models that were defined. So here we are defined two models, present 18 and present uh, 18 3D and give the pass to activation directories, then for all ROIs, for all subjects, uh, we get the uh, uh, correlation, and then average over subjects, and then plot it. So I'll run this now. It will take um, around five to 10 seconds maximum. And then we can plot the results. So as you could see here, like um, in most of the ROIs, the, uh, especially a higher ROIs, ResNet 3D is showing a bit higher correlation. Um, so that says like uh, uh, training on kinetics data set, which is trained on action recognition is more relevant as compared to uh, as compared to training on ImageNet, which is an object classification score. And also we could look at a different layer, which 
so what average pool layer were in average pool layer there was no spatial and temporal information but if we select layer four which has only spatial information in case of resonant 18 and spatial plus temporal information in case of resonant 18 3d we might see a more uh, reasonable difference so this will again take 10 seconds And here you could see like a, in early ROIs, there's almost no difference in V1, 2, V2, V3, but in higher ROIs, LOC and EVA, EVA there's a clear difference between our 3D model and uh, ResNet 2D model that only takes into account the spatial, uh, uh, spatial features. So what we'll do next is we can, uh, now, since we do, uh, these models were run on the uh, validation set, what we'll do is make the prediction for all of the, uh, for all the subjects, all ROIs here, I have included our uh, whole brain as well, so that we make prediction for uh, both full track and mini track. And when I run this, it will, it will generate a prediction for layer four of our 3D18 for um, all the ROIs, all the subjects. And once this is done, which will take around one minute, uh, we could prepare the submission file. So uh, this is the code to, so what it does is it goes over all the submission file and combines into one zip file. And after running all this code, what we'll have is two zip files corresponding to two tracks. So mini track, PKL file contains the results that you need. Uh, we need in the challenge server to compare against. And uh, since the challenge server requires the result to be submitted in a zip file, this mini track zip file contains the, the PKL file and save for full track PKL zip and full track PKL. And that's all you need to do for prepare a baseline submission to the challenge. And uh, it hardly takes more than 30 minutes. So, uh, and I think this again here, uh, I'm going to present the same result that we, uh, with layer four, uh, we see a clear difference between the uh, spatial uh, R3D versus ResNet 2D, but it's not very clear in uh, average pool layer where the spatial and temporal dimension were average in both the cases. And, with this, I think uh, these, uh, these, uh, the tutorial is almost done. So uh, we have already prepared a submission file and I would like to thank the Algonauts committee, uh, Algonauts team for the help and support and feedback on the dev kit. And I'm open to new questions. And if they are not, we can try something else here as come like comparing to the random network, but yeah. Sure, let's pause a few minutes to see if there's any questions. Okay, no questions. I think, yeah, go ahead and continue with a little bit. I think we have time to take a little short break right after you're done. Um, so take it away. Okay. okay, then, so then let's try something else. So we were, for now we have compared Resident 18 versus uh, a 2D model with Resident 3D. When we, what we could do is simply set uh, pre-trained equal to false and now it will, uh, will uh, what we'll do is extract the features from a random model and we can 
rename this this as random and this as random okay then we run this So this is fine because there, there's no resident 18 here. And if we again run the feature extraction, which will take around eight minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to well, ask in between while well, this is running. So the, what we'll do is we will compare the network with random weights versus network with train weights to learn whether training makes a difference in prediction or not. Oh, okay, we have a question while that's running. Um, just for everyone uh, to note, um, actually, yeah, are you wrapping up? Should, we, should I tell people, um, you know, if the case they need to take a restroom break or something, we'll start maybe 15 after the hour. Does that sound good with the remainder? Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah I, I'm done. So this is just the like additional stuff yeah, since we have time. Yeah. Okay, sure. So. So everyone, we will start up with the actual presentations of the winners of the Algonauts competition uh, at 15 after the hour. So feel free to take a little break. I will pause the video recording here. Feel free to stay on. There is a question um, and I'll direct that now. Um, uh, Shigu asks, can you elaborate a bit more on the pre-processing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, what we did was uh, we uh, applied a finite impulse response model to uh, uh, to uh, process from the raw values to FIR beta values from, and at each time, uh, with time resolution equal to one second. And so, and then we took uh, the uh, time to, uh, TR from uh, the uh, response from TR5 to TR9, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's so five seconds after the stimulus onset. And that's all I know about the pre-processing since I, 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 I didn't do it directly myself. So yeah, that's all I know. But if you are interested in more details, you could look at Elgnaut's web page where it's uh, explained in detail. Great. Okay, we'll take a break um, till 15 minutes after and we'll get started at that point. The submission is still open. Uh, it will be interesting also to know how you can further improve it if you want to uh, participate, even if the challenge is over. Uh, so mainly this session will be one hour and I am just the moderator here. So what we will do is uh, each of the speaker will have a nine minute talk and then we will have three minutes for questions. During the talk, please uh, ask questions in the Q&A chat, and you can also upvote for the more in, um, interesting uh, questions. So the one that has more votes, uh, that will be the one or the ones that uh, will be asked to the presenters. Uh, so please uh, do participate. Uh, so we have uh, this fantastic lineup of uh, participants who actually got very good results in the challenge and uh, we want to know how they did it. So we will have uh, first uh, Robert Lange, then Mikhail uh, Nalik. Uh, Kong Juan uh, could actually not join, unfortunately, uh, due to some technicalities. Um, so you can read the report if you are interested on in what he did. So as you see here, the order, uh, the talks of the speakers uh, go from the ones that got less score to the one to the actual winner for one of the tracks, either the, the mini or the full. Uh, 
and all of them are very interesting. So um, uh, then we will have Shinji Nashimoto, then we will have Roman uh, Yannick, who got the second in full and mini. So, and finally, uh, the winner of uh, the full and the mini tracks, uh, who is uh, Husen Yang, and they all are going to talk about uh, their methods. Uh, so please, uh, the first uh, speaker, uh, Robert, if you could, uh, yeah, he raised hand. I think Kendrick uh, will promote you to panelists and then you can share your screen. Yep, should be happening. So please remember everyone to ask questions uh, in the Q&A chat during the talk. Uh, because we have here a very uh, timely session, let's say. And I, oh, sorry. I hope perfect. you can hear me. Yes. Could okay. you give me the screen? <laughs> Stop share. Uh, so just one, one thing, uh, one, I, I will just let you know when you should wrap up. Okay. Perfect. I hope Great. that this will not be necessary, but thank you. Okay. Um, can everyone see my, my slides and hear me well and see me yes. well? Perfect. Wonderful. So hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk about my fifth place, Argonauts Minitrack submission. I'm Robert Lange, a third year PhD student at the Technical University of Berlin mainly working on uh, machine learning and more specifically meta learning and collective behavior. And while I didn't win this year's challenge, I do want to share a set of insights that I gained while competing. And uh, the talk is mainly structured in, in into three parts. First, I will introduce sort of the general computational pipeline. I used to uh, test different hypotheses. Radek already alluded to um, the fact that there was more data in this challenge um, compared to, to pre the previous challenge. Afterwards, I will sort of uh, review initial explorations, comparing different architectures, compression techniques, and encoding models, and then um, introduce sort of my final solution approach. And uh, finally, I will discuss a set of negative results, which did not bear fruits, but shaped sort of my understanding of the problem. Okay, so with this being out of the way, uh, let's get started. So initially, when I began working on the challenge, I wanted to have a general sort of computational pipeline through which I could explore the different computational ingredients um, to, to a potential solution. And on this slide, you can see um, the three major building blocks I focused on. First, um, the network architecture used to compute frame-wise feature activations. Second, the dimensionality reduction technique used to compress the network features. And third, the encoding model used to fit the fMRI voxel data. And um, I fit um, an encoding model to, uh, for each subject and draw a combination and evaluate the aggregated performance using a voxel weighted correlation score. I tune um, the hyperparameters of the encoding model using a tenfold cross-validation together with a Bayesian optimization pipeline. And once that is done, I uh, compute or I retrain uh, the best performing encoding model using the hyperparameters from Bayesian optimization on the full data and obtain um, the test predictions. And like I already sort of alluded to, um, I, I take this pipeline and loop over the different network layers and um, parallelize the Bayesian optimization loop across subjects and regions on a CPU cluster. So equipped with this sort of general um, uh, setup, I started to explore the impact of, of these three different ingredients I, I spoke about. So first I evaluated a set of different dimensionality reduction techniques for um, a ResNet50 architecture or ResNet50 features and uh, a partial least squares encoding model. Um, the, the techniques I considered included um, autoencoders, multidimensional scaling, UMAP, and a principal component analysis for um, different dimensionalities. And in the plot that you can see here on the left-hand side of the figure or of the slide, um, I, I show the, the cross-validated correlation score for the different uh, regions of interest on the x-axis and for the different uh, compression techniques on the y-axis. 
And uh, the brighter the cell, the better the score. And what one can sort of observe um, is that uh, in general, uh, PCA down to 50 components um, seem to work best. And uh, nonlinear compression techniques, uh, like for example, the, the autoencoder uh, or uh, UMAP did not seem to, to help a lot. And next, I looked at um, sort of the network architectures and compared different feature generating architectures for this uh, 50 dimensional PCA and PLS encoding and uh, found that uh, resonant architectures sort of um, uh, tended to perform well, uh, regardless of, of sort of the size. And finally, um, I compared several different um, encoding models ranging from simple um, regularized regression uh, models to uh, more elaborate um, multi-layer perceptrons and um, found that both sort of this partial least squares encoding technique as well as the multi-layer perceptrons tended to perform well. And uh, due to the fact that the MLP models um, tended to, to use a little bit more of compute and tended to, um, uh, to, to take more time to be trained, I focused on the PLS encoding scheme. Okay. So this was sort of the, the initial exploration of these ingredients. And then afterwards, um, I sort of looked at, uh, at more different um, sort of network architectures from uh, sort of semi-supervised, self-supervised uh, learning domains and um, came up with uh, a final submission, which is based on um, a semi-supervised training paradigm called uh, SimClear. And uh, SimClear uh, combines a contrastive objective with different data augmentation techniques. So what do I mean by this? So the, the intuition um, is actually pretty simple. And the intuition is that images that were generated from the same sample, but with different uh, augmentations should yield similar representations, while transformations of different samples uh, should result in more diverse representations. And these transformations include random crops, color distortions, or, or Gaussian blurs. And after um, uh, the network is sort of trained in this unsupervised fashion, um, the ResNet architecture um, is, is then fine-tuned on ImageNet. And afterwards, there's a self-distillation step where essentially the model is trained on its own um, sort of logic predictions. And I experimented with uh, different sort of ResNet architectures with, with different depth and uh, sort of selective kernels and uh, non-selective kernels. And uh, sort of what I found is that, uh, again, uh, ResNet 50 with uh, more depth, um, but with PCA down to 50 components performed. And I, I sort of hypothesized that um, this unsupervised pre-training paradigm where you take different random crops and um, sort of apply blurring might facilitate representations which are uh, sort of better adapted um, to the motion in, in the videos. Because when I, I sort of uh, uh, eyeballed these different uh, videos, it seemed like there was oftentimes not a lot of um, change happening, but um, sort of very small motions. Okay. So uh, I can give you a little bit more of an insight into um, this uh, SimClear um, sort of fitting procedure. And uh, I took a closer look at how well the, the individual layers um, sort of uh, fit the, the different regions of interest. And in this plot here on the y-axis, you can now see um, the different layers of um, the SimClear pre-trained ResNet architecture. And there are 25 or 25 blocks. Um, and on the x-axis, again, sort of these different regions of interest of the mini track. And um, what you can see is that in general, um, sort of at the, the bottom part, um, uh, the, the later layers perform better at fitting the more functionally specialized regions like EBA, FFA, LOC. And um, the earlier layers um, tended to do um, better on fitting the, 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 the ventral stream V1 to V4. I also investigated um, the effect of Bayesian optimization on the performance of the uh, PLS encoding models. And um, I found that for each of the individual layer fitting procedures, um, Bayesian optimization improved the final decoder, uh, encoder. Okay, so this is sort of it about my final uh, submission, but I also um, want to, to tell you something about the things that, that didn't work out in, in the challenge or in my efforts and uh, show you two, two negative results, which I find interesting. So the first um, negative result is, uh, is shown here. And what you can see is um, 
essentially my hypothesis or my question uh, whether or not a, a bold like temporal filtering of the neural network activity over frames could help in encoding neural activity. So what do I mean by that? Um, what you can see on, on, on the right hand side of the slide is essentially a, a resonant neuron uh, watching um, a video of, of a duck. And uh, you can see um, the, the activations of the different frames and um, basically taking the signal, you could either sort of mean over the entire time period, or you could think of different weighting schemes of the different frames. So what I did is I, I came up with a set of different sort of uh, hemodynamic, hemodynamic response kernels and uh, filtered the, the individual activations um, using, using that kernel. And sort of the hypothesis was um, if I could get a pre-processing procedure, which is more similar to how the, the human fMRI data was, um, was processed, maybe this could, could help in, in, in doing the neural um, encoding. But it turns out, uh, basically, I applied um, a set of different filters and, and none of them really performed um, any or a lot better than, than just using the, the, mean, um, uh, the mean as in Chittich um, uh, tutorial. And uh, something else that I looked at was sort of uh, what frame rate to use uh, of the videos. And uh, it turned out that this also didn't matter a lot. So you could save some computation in the initial feature generation when sort of uh, using uh, only a fourth of all the frames provided. And Robert, just one thing, you should be wrapping up uh, soon. Okay, I will, I will. the next thing or the last thing um, I also explored was uh, sort of looking at more biologically inspired neural networks and um, I looked at uh, V1 networks since they performed really well on, on the brain score um, leaderboard and uh, are based on sort of this uh, V1 fitted stochastic Gabor filter bank. Um, uh, as sort of the, the first layer, and um, it fits sort of uh, the cellular macaque recordings fairly well. Um, but when I looked at sort of our challenge of the, the, um, the three second video snippets, um, this didn't perform better than, than my final solution. And this sort of brings um, up the, the general question of how much um, sort of fits to cellular macaque recordings uh, can generalize first to, to different <laughs> stimuli, right, in the sense um, that we now have moving images, and second of all to, to, to human fMRI. So to conclude, I, I showed you sort of my, my general pipeline, um, my solution based on uh, the SEMA set provides some clear um, features, um, and I, I showed you two, two negative results which didn't work out. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm um, looking forward to your questions and uh, to learning more about the um, uh, next year's uh, Argonauts Challenge. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thanks a lot for uh, your presentation. Uh, so I don't see any questions in the, in the chat, but uh, please, uh, if you have questions, do write them now or raise your hand and I can give you uh, microphone permissions. Um, otherwise, uh, in the meantime, uh, I just uh, want to say that it was very interesting to hear also about the failures, uh, because we learn not only from what works, but also from what didn't work. And yeah, I really appreciated that you shared this with us because, uh, yeah, it's not always done. Uh, and I think they were also interesting trials, uh, good thoughts. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe if no one wants to ask a question, you can find uh, my code and also the report in, in this GitHub repository linked on the right bottom corner of the slide. Perfect. So actually, we are a bit already oh. uh, going into uh, the time of the next talk. So uh, even if you have questions uh, for Robert, also please uh, feel free to ask them and he can also answer in the chat. And we can go to the next talk uh, now. Uh, uh, and thank you to the organizers for organizing. It was really nice and I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so next uh, speaker is uh, Mikhail Nalik. Um, yeah, he's there. Perfect. And he will present us uh, his solution to us. OK, just give me a second. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Oh, uh, there is a question for the previous speaker. I don't know, Gemma, if you want to do that. Oh, perfect. Since uh, Mikhail has still not started, so let's do that.
So Robert, are you still there? Uh, I have okay. to give a talk. Yes, though. okay. So was there any area that care a bit more about the sampling rate of input videos? Um, no, uh, so, if, oh, if you analyze them. Yeah, go ahead, um, please. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Um, so the scores that I showed were sort of pooled over the different subjects, right? I didn't look uh, at the fine grain, sort of whether or not one single individual was fitted better with a higher sampling rate or a lower one. But in general, this didn't seem to matter. Okay, fantastic. So you can still ask questions to Robert, but he can type the answers directly. So uh, yeah, indicate in the, in, the, in the chat. So indicate, please, if uh, the question is uh, for Mikal or for Robert. And please remember to ask questions. So Mikal, please. You are muted. Okay, I hope it's better now. Yes, now you can oh, just start. Can you see the presentation well? Yes. Okay, yeah. hi, my name is Michal Nahi. I'm from Prague. I participated also in the Algonauts Challenge. I participated in the, both in the full track and mini track. I finished fifth in the full track and with actually exactly the same code, I finished ninth. So you can find the source code on my GitHub, including this presentation, if you want to see it. And then my solution was fairly simple. It was basically just an ensemble of two models, which have a very similar architecture. They pull features from the pre trade frozen models and then encode those features using the linear layer in a much smaller space. Then I calculate some features over the sequence of frames and then use again a linear layer to predict all the voxel activity. There were some tricks to make this work well. So one of the main tricks was using the weight normalization of linear layers. I will explain that uh, later how that works. Using all the combinations of repetitions for training, this allows uh, increasing the training data size and uh, using the frames per second of the video as a feature and then using a weighted loss function. So I will start with some data preprocessing. I just resized the videos to 224 pixels. Then I skip around the number of frames at the start and resample it to five frames per second and then use heavy augmentations. The idea behind the skipping the random number of frames is that I hope that some that each time the video is taken, the different frames will be sampled and it will help with the overfitting of the network. So, the training was done. Uh, I split the data into two parts. First, 900 videos were used for training, and then last 100 for validations. From the three repetitions, I could create seven combinations. So, that increased my training data size, which greatly improved the final score. I trained it for four epochs, and I used two different optimizers. I used a different optimizer for each of my networks. Uh, the loss function was a weighted mean square error. I calculated weight for each sample based on its absolute value. The uh, idea behind this was that actually the distribution of the voxel activity seems like a normal distribution. So we have a plenty of samples with a zero value. So you can see on the lower part that if we train the network without the weighted loss, it will predict more or less things around zero and not much the voxels with not much the values with higher activity, while with a weighted loss, it does a better job and it did increase the score in the end. Now, my model actually consisted mainly of two parts. The first part is encoder, which takes uh, frames from the video, uh, process them through the pre-trained frozen network, pull some features from each layer of the network, then concatenate the features and use a linear layer to small to embed it in a smaller space. Then the second part is a decoder, which takes the sequence of the features, which represent the frames, calculate some features over that at the frames per second value and use a linear layer to predict the voxel activity. Uh, here is the 
with normalization for the linear layer. Uh, normally, the output of the linear layer is just a weighted product uh, or product of a weight and an input with some bias. But in this case, the weight is calculated by two values, V and G. Uh, I link the paper explaining the idea behind it, but we can see that it actually, the V represents a, has the same shape as the weight originally, but the G adds a extra parameter for every output. Uh, actually just doing this increased the score of my network over 40%. So it was a really meaningful change. Uh, for model A, I used the ECA and FNET network, which is a normalization free network. I used it pretty successfully in some other challenges. So I selected it based on comparison with a few other models, but I didn't do really heavy testing. And for pooling, I just used the adaptive max and adaptive average. So it pulled one value from each feature from each layer resulting in over 9,000 features. And then these features were embedded into 512 values. Then the sequence of these features, I took the values from the last frame, the minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation over all the sequence. I added the frames per second, and I used the linear layer to predict the voxel activity. For model B, the encoder was chosen to be a ResNet 50, and it's pretty much the same, except I added a linear layer to, uh, to pull some data from the features. So for every layer, I flatten the, the feature map and then use a linear layer to calculate six output features. This resulted in over 31,000 features for each frame. And this is again, uh, the number is decreased into 1,024 using the linear layer. The decoder on the Model B was a similar, but I added some gated uh, recurrent units with the different layers. This actually turned out to not have a big uh, impact on the final score using the model, but uh, I kept the uh, dated recurrent units just to add more variety into the ensemble. So this is the comparison of the models. The idea behind them is basically the same, just the model B has the extra linear pooling and the extra gated recurrent units in the decoder, and they were trained with a different optimizer. To ensemble these models for the full track, I just used the best models uh, and you took the mean output. And for mini track, I used the last models. There was not much thinking behind that. Uh, these are the results of the validation on the validation score. So we can see the model A actually performs better, even though it is more simple while the model B performs a little worse. Uh, I added the score from the mini track because there is something interesting. You can notice that the model A performs not very well on the V1 to V4 regions. Uh, this turned out to be because the pooling did not capture all the information that was necessary to predict these regions, while the model B that had the additional linear pooling uh, did slightly better. Uh, the combination of them then did pretty well. Mm. Here you can see the final score. I managed to improve the baseline on the full track by 0 0.1 uh, points, uh, while in the mini track not that much. But the interesting thing here is that the model A actually performed uh, worse than the baseline solution in some regions, which pretty much surprised me. Uh, the interesting thing for me was that the Model A performed well for higher level regions, but really bad for the visual cortex. It looks like the pooling that I chose was not enough to capture that kind of information. But the interesting thing that Model A actually has only two linear layers that are learnable. The other parts are just frozen or like the simple calculations. The frames per second also uh, looked as a useful feature that increased the score slightly. And it was important to address the target value imbalance. Ensembling worked really well for this challenge. And so this, so my solution could be improved more by training more models. 
I didn't do much hyperparameter testing, so I believe it also could uh, lead to better score. Uh, and that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks uh, for the talk. So uh, are there any questions? Uh, please uh, type them in the Q&A chat or raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can ask you a question. So sure. yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the all the detailed explanation. Yeah, really interesting. Um, so I, I see that in your solution, you take the features from the frozen encoder from all the layers. Yes. Have you explored how important is uh, instead of just taking one layer, for instance? Uh, I tried to take uh, different layers, but um, I didn't really test it as heavily as maybe the other participants and just took all of them thinking that Hopefully, because I predicted all the regions are in all the voxels at the same time, that the network will automatically took the features that are important for a different regions from a different layers. So I sort of hope that I don't have to deal with it and the network will manage it by itself. Okay, yeah, makes sense, I guess. So um, mm -hmm. also you say that you uh, incorporate the frames per second as a feature. So what, what does it mean? Like the actual number of frames per second? Yeah, actually I put the actual number, which was like 15, 24 or 30, because I resampled all the video on the input to five frames per second. So I didn't want to lose the information and just actually put it as the, as the number. And it did improve the score a little bit. Cool, yeah, great. So are there any other uh, questions? Uh, please raise your hand or type them. You can also continue to ask uh, during the other talks. Uh, if there are not more questions, um, just thank the speaker again. So yeah, thanks thank for you. presenting and thank participating you. in the challenge. And uh, we can move to our next speaker. Uh, who is uh, Shinji Nishimoto. Yeah, he's here, I can see him. Uh, so he ah. will present uh, his approach uh, for participating in the challenge. So uh, can you share the screen? Yes. Fantastic. So just uh, to remind everyone that uh, he was uh, he got third position in the full and the mini tracks. Uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you as well for your kind of introduction. Uh, so this is Shinji Nishimoto from Osaka University. So first, I thank all the organizers, both CCN and Argonauts Project, for provi providing this interesting opportunity. So today, I would like to talk about how I modeled movie evoked brain activity using a vision transformer uh, as a part of the Argonaut challenge. So here is the background. The aim of the challenge is to make a predictive model of human brain activity evoked by movie stimuli. So in visual neuroscience, people have used several different classes of space-time uh, visual features for this purpose. So one of the earliest attempts used a motion image or gabol based features that was designed to mimic how the biological neurons detect local motion information. Um, by training a motion energy encoding model for movie evoked activity 10 years ago, so we have succeeded in revealing precise space-time representation such as voxel-wise receptive field, retinotopic organization, or and spec speed of the in the occipital visual areas. More recently, people have also uh, used a, a com convolutional neural network or CNN and found that uh, there's a, a hierarch hierarchical correspondence between layers of a deep neural network and the visual processing stream, such as V1 is well modeled by CNN layer three, V3 is modeled by layer four, and MT is uh, uh, modeled by layer five, and so on. Then here comes vision transformer 
a new architecture to model vision. So transformer is originally a language model with hierarchical self-attention mechanisms. So notably, transformers are not based on a visual CNN, but achieved several state of the art performance in some vision tasks. Then the question the, that the other features embedded in transformer effective in modeling brains, are there any hierarchical correspondence like CNN layers did? Uh, there are many, there are, there are, those are main questions that I, I wanted to ask by joining the, this challenge. So more specifically, I was interested in Timesformer, a new space-time vision transformer that aims to process movies. So as many of you know, the original vision transformer divides images into small patches and then use these patches just like they are word vectors in a language model. Then th these visual words are fed into transformer self-attention units, like, just like BART or GPT-3. And Timesformer also makes patches of video frames, but instead of processing full self-attention for these space-time patches, they process uh, space attention and time attention separately to achieve efficient learning and inferences and give the state-of-the-art performance for some vision tasks as described in this paper. So given this background, uh, here is the data and analysis. So I use the algorithm's data, including you know, uh, these movies and the brain activity. And then from the movie stimuli, I extracted video features using the timesformer motion energy or both. More specifically, the timesformer consists of 12 blocks of self-attention units with 768 embedded vector channels. And here I simply integrated uh, over position encoding information for simplicity. Thus, our full model contains 768 features for each of the 12 layers or blocks. For the motion energy features, uh, it, uh, they detect spatially localized uh, motion information by space-time Gabor filters for different position, motion direction, speed, and sizes. To cover a full uh, spectrum of motion, I used around 2,000 of these feature detectors. Then using these features, I built a voxelized encoding model using a, a ridge regression. And to optimize the regularization parameter, I used 10% holdout uh, data within the training samples as validation. And here is the results. Uh, First, I examined layer-wise modeling accuracy using the Timesformer features. Uh, the x-axis shows the Timesformer uh, layers are used in the model, layer 1 through 12. And the y-axis shows the uh, model prediction accuracy for each uh, region of interest, V1, V2, through FFA, through the whole brain. And what I, I found is that uh, there is a certain degree of correspondence between layers and visual hierarchy, where the early visual areas like V1 through V4 are predictable using early layer features like layers 4, 5, and 6, while the higher visual areas are predictable using late layer features like layer 9, 10, 11, so on and so on. Uh, next thing I examined was if I could improve models by concatenating model features. So as you know, human brains, human brains process many kinds of motion information, including human movement, object handling, optical flow, or animal or non-animate uh, motion information. However, each of the, the, the times from a pre-training movie datasets cover only a subdomain or subpopulation of the motion information, like Kinetics 600, 600 takes care of human motion and how to 100 m or million takes care of a human hands doing something. So then one idea is that if each one of the pre-trained model, uh, pre model takes care of the uh, only a part of the full information, then can we simply concatenate these embedding features to cover a broader range of motion features that our brains care? 
So I built encoding models based on times former models that were pre-trained using different movie datasets, including Kinetics 400, 600, something, something V2, and how to handle them. And then uh, 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 make the prediction and test the accuracy. And what I found was that uh, the pre-trained models exhibit largely similar prediction accuracy across models. And um, maybe with a slight advantage on how to handle a, a trained model. And also that uh, feature concatenated models uh, work the best for most of the region of interest. Then I also compared modeling accuracy using uh, motion energy features time former features and concatenated hybrid model. So in comparing motion energy and time former features, I found that the motion energy model works well in early uh, visual areas, but the time former model uh, works better in higher order visual areas and also the full brain on average. Also, the hybrid uh, concatenated model gives the best performance for most of the uh, region of interests. And just post hoc examination, I was also curious whether a uh, visual transformer and CNN models predict different parts of the brains. So I found that uh, the Algorand website just released a 3D uh, visualization of participants' model prediction accuracy. And uh, mo since most of the entries use CNN, so I visually compared the prediction maps for hours, the uh, set of the art uh, team who the uh, map and the RxNet baseline. And what I found was that uh, these prediction maps looks fairly similar. And that, that might in indicate that uh, the visual transformer and CNN take care of similar representational features. That is kind of interesting to me because that, uh, the architecture of visual transformer and CNN are very different, but they might converge into a shared representation. So in summary, so uh, beyond transformer, what transformer features are useful in modeling movie evoked brain activity, and there's a certain hierarchical correspondence between transformer layers and the visual stream in the brain. And the concatenations of multiple uh, features using different pre training data or different architecture between motion energy and time summer in the beta models. And just a final slide. So, uh, if you are interested in this kind of quantitative studies for understanding perception or even higher order cognitions, we have openings for my new lab at Osaka University that just uh, opened this year or a national institute part for more application-oriented studies. And uh, our studies, including like, a, like semantic space wave motion or uh, full brain encoding or uh, decoding models of uh, cognition that can uh, predict uh, virtually everywhere in the brain. And we are in CNET and equipped with fancy toys, including like seven test MRI and three of three test MRI and make and so on. Okay, so that's all. Uh, so thank you, for, thank you for listening. Great. Thanks for the talk. I applause for everyone. <laughs> uh, so if anyone has a question, again, please uh, type it in the Q&A chat or raise your hand. Um, so in uh, the meantime, maybe I can, yeah, also uh, thank you for sharing all the details and all the analysis that you did. That was very interesting. Um, that you guys are doing and share with us. And so I uh, hear just like a, a simple question. When you take the times transformer, the times former, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. do you take all the frames in the video? Do you sample them to homogenize them? How, how do you handle the video? And, how, oh. uh, and I, I don't know if you uh, noticed that it is important or you didn't play with that at all. Oh, yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, I have sampled actually the, uh, the movie frames from 30 frames per second to uh, five or six frames uh, because the, the, the original model uh, 
or the at least the, the pre-training model I, I used uh, uh, were designed to uh, input that kind of uh, uh, several frames, not, not uh, 30 uh, frames or something. So, and uh, uh, one concern is that, uh, so that, that might uh, change the, uh, the frame rate that was originally uh, assumed uh, in pre-training and there may be difference between that uh, uh, frame per second. So, so that in that sense, maybe potentially my implementation is suboptimal in you know, full use of the, the pre-training uh, model. So that can be revisited uh, to make better model. So that's what I thought after everything is done. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks for uh, the answer. So we have here uh, another question from uh, Ginny Kim. Uh, so thank you for the great talk. Simple question. When using pre-trained model from a public data set, have you also tried embeddings from moments in time data set, which seems to be similar with the data set provided by Algonauts? Moment of time, uh, what, uh, what, what do you mean? So, so when I use uh, the, uh, the, the pre-training model I used uh, all, all from the uh, GitHub web page of the Timesformer. So they uh, provided the GitHub uh, source code as well as several uh, 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 models, including the like uh, kinetics or how to handle them. So uh, those are what I use. So yeah, it's interesting to uh, uh, use a more diverse set of uh, stimuli or uh, pre-trained models. And I believe that uh, that, that will uh, further increase the, the coverage of the uh, embedding features and thus hopefully uh, will increase the, the prediction accuracy. But yeah, uh, that's what uh, so, so far I, have, I haven't done that yet. Great, so um, thanks again. Uh, if there are no more questions and also time's up for uh, this uh, talk, so we can move to the next talk. So thanks again uh, for presenting. And so next speaker is uh, Romuald Janik. Uh, are you there? Hi. Yes, fantastic. So yes, great. So you can... Uh, share your screen now. Do you see it? Yes. So <laughs> he got second position in full and mini track, and he will now present his solution. So please go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot for the <coughs> introduction to the great challenge. So first, I would like to say that well, our team consists of Michael Oleshik and myself. So we are from from Poland, from Krakow. We are physicists, but kind of doubling a bit with neural networks and interested in neuroscience. So um, the motivation for entering this challenge for us was really first the question, so how do the contemporary machine learning constructions like exactly like transformers or contrastive learning, how do they compare to the brain? And how do they compare with the conventional deep CNNs which were used for classification? So this was one question which we were interested in answering for ourselves. Secondly, of course, it would be very interesting to explore the visual system hierarchy, the various regions of interest, how do they compare with location within DNNs and the various models derived from DNNs. And finally, the work in motion, namely how, the, how to understand the impact of motion on activations of the visual system. So these were the questions that we were posed, we proposed for ourselves when entering the challenge. So our framework, was in fact extremely simple. It, <clears throat> the pipeline for analyzing the problem was basically the pipeline from the development code, namely to first to evaluate neural network features for each frame. And here, of course, we have to ask the question which neural network and which layer to use. Then we added a new, well, a very simple thing, namely we wanted to aggregate features from the neural networks into some receptive fields. And then the question would be whether to do it as take the average, take the maximum, what kinds of receptive field sizes to use, what is the geometry, and so on. And then we'd like to aggregate the features across all the frames. And here one could either use averaging, like in the development kit, or for example, check maximum. And finally, we just use a very simple regressor, namely a linear rich regressor with some regularization parameter 
which, which turned out to be quite high, but it, it worked uniformly well for all kinds of networks and layers which we tried. So this was our baseline model. And then later we introduced some refinements. So first of all, we wanted to incorporate motion related features. And secondly, since it turns out that receptive fields are quite important in our solution, we want to refine the sizes and overlaps and see what, what happens. Okay, so first, the types of neural networks that we studied. So we used the standard set of classification networks, AlexNet, BGG, and ResNets. Then we used two very variants of the contrastive learning approaches, SimClear and Potop typical constructive learning. And in fact, a visual transformer network, but not the one which <coughs> Shinji mentioned about <coughs> dealing with movies, but just for static images. And the conclusions were that, in fact, the long biggest ResNet was best for the majority of regions of interest. ResNet 50 was best for V2 and V3, but in fact, ResNet 152 was also very good. So it's really best overall. Unfortunately, these more modern approaches were not really competitive with the solutions that we get using those classical networks. But of course, we did not use the uh, variants which were used for, uh, for movies, for, for motion. Okay, so these are the networks. Now we can ask which layer depths are optimal for particular regions of interest. And here it turns out that at least for this very coarse grained outputs from, from ResNet, which correspond to the blocks which were shown in the tutorial section. Basically, layer two, which is quite high up in the, uh, in the depths of ResNet, seems to be the best for eight out, out of the nine regions of interest. And just for V1, layer one is a bit better. So, it was a bit surprising because we thought that there would be larger differences, but of course we did not look at the fine uh, structure here. What happens when we look at like all those layers which are in between those course stages. Anyway, therefore, basically for all those models, for all those regions of interest, we use these type of features, which are 14 by 14 square of 124 channels. And the differences between those different ROIs lies in aggregating those features into different perceptive fields. So what do I mean by that? So this is the data which comes from the neural network layer. And then suppose that we want to aggregate it into four perceptive fields. So we just take this square, and then we would like to aggregate all those, all those uh, channels here into a single number, well, into 124 numbers. And we can do it either using averaging, averaging or taking the maximum here. And we can also do similar things when we take the output for each frame and we aggregate it over the frames, aggregate, aggregate over time. Then we can also do averaging, like was, as was done in the development kit, or we can take also maximum over time. So therefore, we have in total four ways of, of aggregating, right? Two permutations here, <coughs> two times two, so four possibilities. And we find that uniformly for all of our eyes, taking the maximum in both cases performs best. So this is the choice where we have maximum over time and maximum over space. So from now on, we skip, we keep just this choice. Now, if we have those receptive fields, we can now try to determine the optimal number size of the receptive fields for each region of interest. So for that, we can do like two by two, three by three, five by five, seven by seven, nine by nine. So this is the outcome of, of cross-validation cross scores. And the one marked in red are the highest ones. So you see that as we go deeper into the brain, basically, we go from finer, smaller receptive fields into larger ones, which are more and more non-local. And it's very kind of consistent picture which, which emerges here. So going upward in the visual hierarchy corresponds to more global, more global features. And moreover, the aggregation here is always nonlinear by taking the maximum. So basically with these choices, we got 
so this was our base drive solution. So our first um, first submission, which gave, which was already in the second place slot of the competition. So basically, it's a very simple simple uh, set of, of of choices, and then we tried to do refinements of this of this base drive solution. However, those refinements didn't just gave some small incremental changes. So the main kind of reason for this kind of score was just receptive fields and the manner of aggregating over space by maximum and over time also by taking the maximum features. So how to incorporate movement? So of course, those features which I described so far do not distinguish between just a static image and a really dynamic motion packed movie clip. So we tried um, initially just to take like two snapshots, two frames, and add those features to, um, uh, to the regressor. However, this did not work very well, basically because of large dimensionality. And also we thought that perhaps it would be much more, make much more sense to have non-semantic motion features, just to detect motion irrespective of the content of the movie. So therefore we decided to construct those features by hand. So we did it by estimating frame by frame displacements for the whole picture and for nine image patches on the frame. And then compute the overall mean displacement and absolute values, and absolute values in order not to be sensitive to the direction of motion. And in fact, it, it turns out that adding those features was important for, for the scores. And we just appended those data to the neural network features from the baseline solution. And then we looked for each individual region of interest, how this test score <coughs> improves. And we found that for PPA, you get a huge boost, slightly less to for V4, which was a bit surprising for us, and also something for, for EBA. So in the end, we used PPA and the V4 with the motion features and the rest as before. The second improvement was refining the receptive feeds. So since receptive feeds were important, perhaps one could see if we modify the sizes and overlaps, we can see how well. So maybe this tells us also about how it's kind of the brain integrates the various parts of the of the uh, of the frame um, of the visual field. So for example, for the higher log EBA and FFA, we used three three by three receptive fields. So since 14 is not divisible by three, there's some overlap. And it turns out that it, we get better scores if we increase this, increase the size of the receptive fields and include include and which introduces some bigger overlaps between the various receptive fields. So this was the conclusion. For our solution, we also used added a central field, but perhaps it was not really necessary. But we did not have really the, the time to study uh, its um, uh, how important it is. Can we get rid of it? For STS, which had this high, um, which had the most non-local features, so just four receptive fields in Shannon, we added first the central field, which boosted the score, which seems quite natural because the central field should be something kind of single, most important, which we should not be the intersection of four different receptive fields. And then um, it turns out that we can get even better results if we just forget about those four receptive fields in the background and just you take the whole frame. So our conclusion was that for STS seems sensitive to purely global features. And those modifications gave our final solution, which just gave a moderate boost of the score. OK, so this was the mini tag solution. For the whole base sol solution, Basically, we see that we have various models which work best for various voxels in the brain. Therefore, we, we would like to, for each voxel, we'd like to choose which model to use. So to do that, we performed cross-validation of the models from the mini tag solution, noting the CV scores, cross-validation scores for each voxel individually. And then we choose the model for each voxel for each subject separately by taking the model which gave the highest CV score for that voxel. And from the baseline solution, we get this answer, but the final solution gets slightly better uh, answer because of course those 
those models here were, were a bit melted, they included motion and they included better receptive fields. Uh, also, we also kind of made some experiments on the site and saw that this individual CV score for a voxel may be quite unstable and noisy. Therefore, perhaps it'd be good to impose special, special consistency by taking the prescribed Minitac model for voxels in a given region of interest. And it gave just a small boost at the, on the third digit. Okay, so this is- just, uh, just one thing, you should be wrapping up. Yeah, I'm coming to the discussion. Great. And so I'm summarizing. So first of all, the first conclusion for us was that classical classification networks seem to be better than modern approaches like contrastive learning or transformers, at least in the way that we use them, which was very kind of simple. Secondly, ResNet 152, so the longest ResNet seems best overall. Now, the layer depth, at least at a very coarse level, is not really here <coughs> correlated with location of the region of interest in the visual hierarchy. So layer two looks best for eight out of the nine ROIs. However, of course, at the final level, we are, we are now interested to look and examine it in detail. Can we see like the dependence on that on depths, but on a much finer level than the one which we studied during the competition. Now, what, what definitely changes is the locality of features. So changing the number of receptive fields. Now, uh, the features definitely are aggregated nonlinearly by taking the maximum, both in space and in time. So one can say that the brain works in this winner takes all paradigm. So just the maximum, uh, maximum is really important. And the rest is not averaged out, but it's ignored. So this is one conclusion which was which comes out of those experiments. Uh, motion features are relevant for PPA and to a lesser degree for V4. And for those higher, higher ROIs, it's beneficial to increase the receptive field size with larger overlaps. And also final conclusion was that for STS, it seems that it's more sensitive to almost completely global features. Okay, so that's it. And I would like also to thank the organizers for for this journey because it was quite interesting also to be able to, to see all, all kinds of kind of take the various conclusions out of, out, out of this data, which was fun. Thank you. Great, fantastic. So thanks for the talk. We are actually a bit over time. So I would uh, leave the questions for the, for the chat. So please uh, pose your questions and you can reply there directly. Uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah. So thanks for uh, your presentation and all the details and also the interesting approach, uh, which is all the approaches are very different from all the participants. So this makes it very interesting for all of us. Great. So um, uh, we can now go to our uh, last speaker, uh, Hu Zheng Yang, uh, who oh, is. Hi, you are here. Perfect. So he is the winner of uh, both tracks, uh, the mini and the full track, and he will now present us uh, which uh, method he used for uh, winning the competition. So please, uh, you can go ahead. Oh, thank you for the introduction. Let me share my slides. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Hu Jin Yang. I just finished my undergrad at USTC and I work on computer vision and neural imaging at Brain and Intelligence Lab. So before I jump into this, I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this great event. We had great fun during the challenge. So let me share how we build the model and our findings during the experiments. So first, an intuitive way of explaining our Motivation is that the brain is multimodal. It responds to visual stimulation from different perspectives, like color, shape, motion, and etc. And in computer vision, we can do similar things. For example, we can have a general model that takes RGB frames as input, or a motion model that takes optical flow as input, or an edge model that outputs perceptual edges. 
So instead of choosing which model is best for each ROI, we combine all models by a weighted ensemble. A simple average ensemble without weights won't improve the score so much because well, some models are just best for the job, like, like audio model for early visual areas. So ensemble is weighted and the weighted and the weight is optimized by differential evolution to give a maximum score on the validation set. This way is guaranteed that the combined validation score is higher than any single model because, well, it's, it's optimized for the maximum validation score. So on the left side, the models share an encoder and decoder framework. The decoder part is a simple fully connected layer for mini track and the convolution transpose model for full track. I will talk about these five encoder models one by one in detail. So first, the I3D RGB model. Uh, this is the inflated 3D ResNet model trained on raw RGB frames. We took the pre-trained model from moments in time datasets and take the intermediate layers of ResNet to make predictions. So, I, so the 3D ResNet has a hierarchical architecture of four blocks. We call them RIS1 to RIS4. Then we try to search which layer gives the best validation score for each ROI. You can see in the table, the maximum score is marked as green. They are mostly from RIS3 and RIS4. And also we search the effective receptive field size by changing the pooling size. The, the pooling we import here is adaptive pooling from PyTorch. So a larger pooling size means a smaller effective receptive field size. And in the right table, you can see that V1 to V4 prefer a larger pooling size and the rest always prefer a smaller pooling size. And in this graph, you can find a complete layer and pooling size search result. Again, you can see trends in V1 to V4 that their score improves with pooling size. And the red lines, which is with four layer, gave the pool score on V1 to V4. But for the rest, for the rest ROIs, with three and with four gave the best score. After the layer and pooling size search, we didn't pick the best model for each ROI. Instead, we made a we made an internal ensemble from the search space models. This ensemble drastically increased the best scores as in the right tables. Uh, and all the above models take a single layer from ResNet and make predictions. We call them single layer models. Then we also tried multi-layer models by concatenating layers and try different combinations. We also employed a spatial parameter pooling to combine different pooling sizes, and we also tried adding top-down or bottom-up pathways between layers. However, the multi-layer model didn't get a better score than the single-layer model. This is only true after the internal ensemble. Before the ensemble, the best multi-layer model is slightly better than the best single-layer model. So I talked about I3D RGB model in detail. That's, that's the first of five encoding models. I will go through the rest of four models quickly as we do the same hyperparameter search and internal ensemble on them. The I3D flow model has a similar architecture as the I3D RGB model, but takes, a, takes optical flow as input. And also the flow model is pre-trained on a different data set, Kinetic 400. Also, it uses a higher frame rate than the RGB model, but the overall architecture is quite the same. We, so we did the same search for layers and pooling size and the same internal ensemble. Then we add a model for edge detection, which, which is a bi-directional cascade network model. This model is a bit different from the I3D model because it's a 2D network and we take the final output of for edge detection for, for each frame as input and train an LSTM model. Then we search for input resolution frames and pooling size and made an internal ensemble for each ROI. Then we have the big transfer model, which is also a 2D network. And the BIT was designed for general transfer learning. We searched the pooling size and layers as well. Well, this model is overlapping with I3D RGB model for input modalities, as they both take RGB frames as input. Then lastly, we have the audio model. Well, the audio is not played during the scanning. However, the audio model may still provide some additional information, particularly in multi-sensory brain areas like STS, 
So we made a simple approach by taking the embedding of VGGS model, which is designed for general audio embedded learning. And we did not do any hyperparameter search or internal ensemble. So the result is that the I3D RGB model gave the best score of these five models, most likely because this model was pre-trained on the best data set for the job, which is the multi-label version of moments in time data sets. And you can see from the red side, our submission score improved consistently each time we add a new model to the ensemble pipeline, even the audio model or the overlapping BIT model. We took a further look at difference of models in detail. The table shows the difference of score in percentage compared to the final ensemble model. So darker colors means more difference and the color is made clockwise. As you can see, the flow model gives better score on EBA, LOC, STS, which is the color is shallower in this ROIs. And the edge model gave better score on V1, V2, PPA, FFA. And interestingly, the audio model gave, gave a bad score on V1 to V4, but the audio model can cover 15% of the Pearson correlation for later ROIs. And we also looked at the, uh, the ensemble weights, as in the table, darker color means larger ensemble weights. The colors are made column wise and each column sum sums to one. The upper table shows it for each model and the lower table shows it, shows it for each modality. As you can see, the motion model gives a better score on V4 EBA STS. And if you look at the table row wise, the weight for the edge model is larger in V1 and V2 and audio models prefer EPA, PPA, STS. So for full track, we did basically the same thing with the encoder models, but the decoder is a bit different as we use a convolution transpose model instead of a simple fully connected model. And the output channel is set to turn to bit build a multi-subject model and make predictions for all subjects simultaneously. And since the mini track voxels also appeared in the full track voxels, which retrieved their coordinates by matching their FMI data, the mini track voxels makes about 30% of the full track voxels. And we made a comparison on the same voxels for these two track models. You can see in the table, the mini track model gives a much better score than the full track model on the same ROI, even after the internal ensemble and the final ensemble. We also tried to remove the mini track voxels and train another full track model on the remaining 16% voxels only, but this will drastically decrease the score on the rest of voxels. So to sum up, we built the state of the art model for predict predicting FMI response to videos by combining models from different modalities. And adding new modalities to the ensemble pipeline consistent, consistently improved our scores. So we optimize the validation score to solve the ensemble weights. But to our surprise, we didn't see significant overfitting on the submission score in most ROIs, except for PPA and STS. And also these two ROIs are the two with the lowest scores. And I also want to mention that multi-subject model is better than a single subject model in our experience. Uh, we see that in the dev kit, people use single subject models, but we found multi mixing multi subject voxels into one model uh, makes the score better for every subject. And also for the later ROIs, using only the class label provided by image classification or video classification models also give a decent score, that is, without any intermediate layers. But this approach will give poor scores to V1 and V V1 V2 V4. So that's all. Thank you for listening. And great, fantastic. Thanks uh, for your talk. So this concludes uh, all the talks for um, the winners of the challenge. Uh, so this last one was the winner of the two tracks. Uh, are there any questions uh, for him? So please uh, feel free to type them or raise your hand again. Um, maybe in the meantime, I can ask a question. So um, 
I find many very interesting uh, that the more models you add, the better you get. So uh, have you thought of adding more models? Is there any reason you uh, didn't add more uh, time constraints or something different? Well, well, there's a great effort behind the scenes. You know, adding each model, we need to re-implement the whole thing and tune in, tune in, find and to end. So it's very time consuming and it costs a lot of computational resources. But well, if uh, you see in the BIT model, BIT model takes also RGB frames as input, which is overlapping with the I3D RGB model, but we still get a, a small increase in the submission score. So I assume if we keep keeping keep adding more models, we can get a better score. Great. So yeah, thanks. So we have one question from someone anonymous. So uh, it says, interesting that uh, multi-subject training is best. Can you explain the intuition for this? Well, uh, this is fun during my exper experiment. Uh, um, and you can find similar results in like an SD data set where they also did single subject model and multi-subject model. And they also found multi-subject model is better. So the intuition for this may be that mixing voxels from the same RYs from different subjects uh, uh, reduce overfitting. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so you can go ahead. Um, so my first question is, uh, why did you use differential evolution and not just sort of a linear regression model fit with SGD? Was there, there any well, reason? Well, linear S if you fit a linear regression with SGD, you can end up in local minima. But differential evolution is guaranteed to get the gold global minima if you run it as long as possible. Have you tried sort of um, having a weighted ensemble for each voxel instead of? Oh, I tried that, but there is severe overfitting if we do it voxel-wise instead of ROI-wise. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you say uh, multi-subject models were better than single-subject models, am I understanding this correctly, that you predict the same or that you submit the same prediction for each subject, or do you have like a subject ID categorical variable? As no, the, the pre prediction for each subject is different, but we mix the voxels to uh, the same output of a model. Okay, so the encoding is subject specific, but sort of the, the features that you extract are, are trained on all subjects together. Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Really awesome submission. And yeah, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so great. Uh, if there are no more questions, actually also time is up. So um, let's thank all our speakers again who participated in the channel in the challenge and uh, yeah, with uh, very interesting approaches and very diverse. So I personally learned a lot from all of you. So thank you. And yeah, I hope you participate again next year. Uh, details will come later about uh, next challenge. So a round of applause for everyone. And this ends this uh, session, and I I pass it to Radek or Kendrick. I don't know if Kendrick wants to go in between. No, not much. We're doing okay on time. I think uh, we have at least half an hour. Uh, obviously, we don't have to take it all. Um, but Radek will have some closing remarks for this all event. Thank Okay, I hope you're seeing the slides, is that okay? Yep. Good. Um, I hope you enjoyed the event so far. So what is to come next in the year or so to come? Uh, for the context, I would like to look back uh, where Argonauts is coming from to, to get you the trajectory that we're going for, um, both in content and in form. So we started way back pre-pandemic, long time ago, 2019, with a challenge and a homely workshop at MIT in person. There we focused on still images 
and highly condensed brain data um, and then use representation similarity analysis um, that suits this. So overall, you could say we started out with smallish data, highly prepared and pre-processed data and a fixed but quick to use and robust framework of how to relate brains and machines. Then 221, format and content are different. In format, we moved from a workshop uh, to team up with CCN as a venue with a vibrant community um, that we believe shares our goals and that we want to excite uh, for this challenge. And also we move forward in content. So um, from still images, we moved on to moving stuff because this is closer to what interests computer vision right now and what we actually really deal with in the real world. We also changed the challenge to whole brain data, so it is richer, and also an encoding approach, which gives you additional flexibility. So what is next? Uh, we can't continue on this trajectory, but there is a move possible in different parts of the space. So you can have more data, richer data, different approaches and things like that. Now you can unfortunately never have it all. You must focus on one thing. And talking to many people, there's one thing that nearly everyone perceives uh, we need, and that is more data. So we need high, bigger data and bigger quality data, which will give us a better sampling of the stimuli for whatever cognitive function you're looking at and the representations so that you can relate them in a more meaningful or more fine-grained fashion to uh, algorithms in AI, which, as you know, often have a huge amount of data available. So therefore, we're happy uh, to announce that we teamed up with NSD, uh, which is a shortcut from the Natural Scenes data set, and CCN together for next year. Now, what is NSD? Um, this is an effort led by Emily Allen and directed by the labs of Tom Nazalaris and Kendrick Kay at the American University of South Carolina and University of Michigan. So what is NSD that is going to make a change? Well, NSD is a lot of things. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible and an amazing amount of different things. And I will only talk about a very small part of this. Um, for us, it's a massive 7T data set that is very much aligned, I think, with the goals that we want to pursue to bridge cognitive and computational neuroscience. And our context here is the type of data and the amount that is the game changer. For all the other things that I will not talk about in this data set is much, much more, please refer to uh, the preprint or to the original paper, which is going to appear soon in an illustrious high impact venue, as I was informed by one of the authors. So uh, the first piece of good news is that this data is online and it's a lot. So we have eight subjects. Um, each one of those saw about 10,000 still images. There is about 73,000 images in total. So if you compare this to the 300 we had two years ago, that is a huge step. Um, there's about 40 hours of data per subject. This is very high resolution data, much higher than we had with 1.8 millimeter. Um, it has therefore also high SNR and um, the organizers or doers of this natural scene data set have uh, put a lot of effort into very strong quality control. So this is just good data. Now, why am I giving you this shop talk on the natural scene data set? Well, this is the second piece of good news. Not the data has been released and it's online now, but not all of it has been released. So um, the organizers of NSD were so kind to keep three sessions for each participant uh, hidden for the Argonauts Challenge 2022. So therefore, a lot of thanks to everyone at NSD, um, because through this, we will be able to offer you an excellent, incomparably rich set of data that didn't exist before and also didn't exist for a challenge that will allow you to think up solutions of how to understand natural and artificial intelligence that were just not possible until now. And with these short closing remarks, I would like to thank you all for attention. Thanks again, the team uh, that made this possible. Thanks again to the organizers of CCN and wish you a good part of day wherever you are in your time zone. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. All right, thanks, Radek. I don't see any questions at the moment, but um, 
thanks to all the speakers, all the organizers, for the Algonauts for making this very first CCN virtual event a success. Uh, as I mentioned, this is recorded. We'll hope to put it up in case there's people who were unable to attend. Um, and they can, and everyone, of course, can review the excellent talks here at their own leisure. Okay, with that, uh, thank you, everyone. And remember, the next CCN event is this Thursday. And check the website for details.